Tonight, breaking news, the deadly home explosion rocking an Ohio neighborhood. Doorbell cam footage capturing the blast. Debris sent raining down across the neighborhood. Cell phone video showing flames consuming the home. At least two people killed, another hurt. The late details just coming in. Also tonight, the depositions from two women who testified against Matt Gates to the House Ethics Committee, now in the hands of a hacker. This as Trump tells reporters he is not reconsidering his choice for attorney general his vice president-elect, J.D. Vance, now headed to the Hill to win over skeptical Republicans. Plus, Dr. Oz goes to Washington, Trump tapping the former TV doctor to oversee the agency for Medicare and Medicaid, how he could play a role in price negotiations for critical prescription drugs. Transgender bathroom battle, the new resolution from South Carolina, Congresswoman Nancy Mace banning transgender women from women's bathrooms on Capitol Hill. She says it's directly targeting Sarah McBride, the first ever openly transgender person elected to Congress, the Speaker of the House now weighing in. Ukraine strikes back, U.S. officials telling NBC News Ukrainian forces launched American-made missiles into Russia just days after President Biden signed off on their use. This as Russian President Putin unveils a new nuclear doctrine, lowering the requirement to hit Ukraine with the devastating weapons. Trump plans America's birthday. The president-elect calling for a year-long celebration reminiscent of the World's Fair of years past. The Iowa State Fairgrounds led it to take center stage, but can they pull it off in time? Our team went to the Hawkeye State to find out. And Italy's $1 homes, you heard us right, the village on the island of Sardinia offering Americans upset over the election results a massive discount on a new home. So what's the catch? We'll explain. And Texas Education Board advancing new curriculum that would put more teachings from the Bible in public schools. Top story starts right now. And good evening. I'm Tom Yamas. We have a lot to get to tonight on President-elect Trump's transition team, including several new nominations just in the last few hours. But we want to begin tonight with that breaking news, the massive explosion decimating an Ohio home. Look at this doorbell cam footage. It shows the house exploding, sending debris flying across the block. And new cell phone video showing the inferno in its wake, flames destroying what was left of the home. At least two people are dead, another person injured. That explosion happening in Bethel, Ohio, a small town about 30 miles southeast of Cincinnati. Maura Barrett starts us off tonight with the investigation now underway. A massive explosion leveling a home in Bethel, Ohio. We have the fire department on scene, so showing or advising the house is gone. This doorbell camera from a neighbor capturing the moment and the falling cloud of debris. If we tell with the debris field, it was a large explosion that had sent debris across the neighborhood. The blast, leaving at least two people dead and one person in the hospital recovering with burn injuries. He's like bent over with his hands on his knees, like trying to get a breath and stuff. And uh, he's all dirt, like his face was dirty. And then I got closer. We were like, are you OK? And his whole hair was singed. Um, and me and the other neighbor were like, you need to go to get an ambulance. Fire officials responding to the scene. The debris field impacting a large portion of the neighborhood. As they say, the remaining fire burned for about 45 minutes. Sound as if I thought somebody had drove into the side of my house. Like I felt the shockwave from through a brick house. Jesus. Is it a house? Yeah. These drone photos showing the extent of the damage as fire officials sift through the scene and investigate the cause of the explosion and fire. It definitely had a large, a large amount of energy to make a house like that um, go apart. Okay, Maura Barrett joins us live from Chicago. Maura, do we know anything more about the possible cause? That's still the big question, Tom, and investigators are prioritizing figuring out the cause. What we do know, those two uh, victims, one man and one woman, though officials aren't sharing any more details about them. As for the person who was transported to the hospital, neighbors told reporters they believe he was a heating and cooling repairman servicing something in the home. We know he was transported, being uh, treated for burn injuries, but we don't have any details at this hour about whether he's been discharged yet, Tom. Okay, Maura Barrett for us, Maura. We thank you for that. Now to a major battle coming to head on Capitol Hill. President-elect Trump's fight to confirm his pick for attorney general, Matt Gates taking a stunning turn. A hacker now in possession of critical testimony from two witnesses who spoke to the House Ethics Committee during their investigation of Gates. 
The two witnesses, including a woman who say Gates had sex with her at a 2017 party when she was only 17 years old. The other witness says she was at the party as well and saw it happen. Gates denies those allegations. The president-elect saying tonight he is standing by his embattled cabinet choice. NBC News reporting Trump has been working the phones for Gates, trying to convince Republican senators to support the former congressman. His vice president-elect, Senator J.D. Vance, headed back to the Hill tomorrow to bolster Trump's lobbying efforts. And this just breaking tonight, Trump announcing another famous ally for a key administration role, Dr. Oz, chosen to lead the agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid. The former TV doctor ran unsex unsuccessfully for Senate in Pennsylvania two years ago. Garrett Haig tonight. Following it all for us from Capitol Hill. President-elect Trump traveling to Texas to witness the launch of a SpaceX rocket, the company run by his key ally, billionaire Elon Musk. And announcing two new administration picks, TV personality and physician Dr. Mehmet Oz as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrator, who Trump says will, quote, work closely with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to take on the illness industrial complex. Critics have accused Dr. Oz of at times offering questionable medical advice. And Howard Lutnick, his transition co-chair and Wall Street executive to serve as Commerce Secretary. All while Trump tonight was asked if he's reconsidering his choice for Attorney General, former Florida Congressman Matt Gates. No. It comes as an unidentified hacker was able to gain access to a file containing depositions of two women who have made allegations against Gates, what is described as damaging testimony, according to a source familiar and an email obtained by NBC News, though it's unclear if the hacked material was released. One of the depositions is from a woman who alleges she had sex with Gates when she was 17, an accusation Gates strongly denies. Both women testified to the House Ethics Committee, which is expected to meet tomorrow to weigh whether to release its report. The House Speaker has said he's against it. The president has the team in place to do what the American people have, uh, have elected him to do, and we're going to support that effort. But some Senate Republicans want to review it. There needs to be legitimate vetting. I think we need to embrace advice and consent with full enthusiasm. Gates was also investigated by the Justice Department over allegations of sex trafficking, but prosecutors ultimately did not file charges. Gates has denied any wrongdoing. Nobody should be disqualified because of a media report. It's more than a media report. He was investigated by the department he wants to leave. And they didn't proceed forward. A transition official tells NBC News Trump has been, quote, heavily working the phones, calling Republican senators to push for Gates. I wouldn't bet my house on it one way or the other. If all Democrats oppose a nominee, they can only lose three Republican votes to be confirmed. What these picks tell me is Donald Trump is going through the same movie chaos, contempt for the law, and disrespect for the American public. Okay, Garrett joins us live from Capitol Hill tonight. So, Garrett, we are learning that tomorrow Vice President-elect uh, J.D. Vance will be there where you are. What exactly is his goal? Well, he's going to have meetings throughout the course of the day with Matt Gates and Pete Hegseth, the defense secretary uh, sort of nominee in waiting, who has some problems with some Republican senators as well. I think the way I'm thinking about this, Tom, is basically a show of force. I think this is an opportunity for Trump to send his most visible surrogate here to the Hill to say we're standing by these guys. We want to get them in front of Republican lawmakers and maybe get some early commitments for support. For example, the only person we know for sure who uh, is going to have one of these meetings tomorrow is John Kennedy, who you heard from briefly in this piece. I think he's a pretty reliable Republican vote for a Matt Gates or a Pete Hegseth. If they can get some of these people, particularly people who won't be on the committees overseeing their confirmation hearings, to kind of lock in yes votes and start to look like they're generating some momentum for these picks, I think they perceive that as something that can be helpful to them. Uh, they want to make sure that, you know, especially Gates doesn't just get buried in negative news uh, before he even has a chance to defend himself in a confirmation hearing, which won't happen until early next year. Yeah, you know, Garrett, while you're there, I mean, you have so much experience on Capitol Hill. What was the vice president-elect sort of reputation there in the Senate, especially among his Republican colleagues? I mean, is he somebody who can convince those potential no votes to be a yes? 
Uh, um, candidly, Tom, he wasn't especially well known. I mean, remember, he was only elected in 2022. He spent the last, you know, several months out on the campaign trail for Donald Trump. He was here for a very short window of time as a junior member on the committees uh, where he served. He didn't make much of a mark legislatively. I think among the pro-Trump set, he developed a pretty, you know, positive reputation. But he's not somebody who's widely known or especially respected. And I don't mean that to sound sort of pejorative or negative. He's just not a known commodity yeah. for senators kind of outside his initial MAGA bubble. This will be a chance, I mean, frankly, in much the same way, by the way, that Kamala Harris was when Joe Biden selected her, to not have a ton of experience actually working within the body. So he'll be building up his own relationships, which will be important for him going forward at the same time he's here tomorrow. Yeah, it might be a tough task, though, what, what the president likes asking him to do. Okay, Garrett yeah. Hick, we appreciate that. Now to a contentious battle over trans rights. Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace introducing a resolution that could ban transgender women from using female bathrooms in the halls of Congress. Today, Mace defending her bill, calling the measure a protection of women's rights. Take a listen. I'm a feminist trying to protect and fighting and vowing to protect women and girls. Um, we have rights as women, and we have the right not to be bombarded by men in our restrooms, changing rooms, or locker rooms. The move, May says, is a direct hit at newly elected Representative Sarah McBride, soon to become the first openly trans person to serve in Congress. McBride posting this on X, quote, Every day Americans go to work with people who have life journeys different than their own and engage with them respectfully. I hope members of Congress can muster that same kindness. Ryan Nobles tonight, live on Capitol Hill with this one. Ryan, walk our viewers through what this is about. Uh, Representative Mace introduced the bill, hoping for Speaker Johnson to include this as part of the House Rules Package for the next Congress. What are we hearing from him tonight? So uh, Mike Johnson was initially asked directly the question about whether or not uh, a man is a man and a woman is a woman and if there's any ambiguity there. He initially didn't answer that question directly, but did talk about the right for all members of Congress to be treated with respect and to have proper dignity. But then later on in the day, he called all the reporters together to make another statement on the issue. Listen to what he said. Uh, a man is a man and a woman is a woman and a man cannot become a woman. That said, I also believe, um, that's what scripture teaches, what I just said, uh, but I also believe that we treat everybody with dignity. So what does that mean in terms of this resolution that Nancy Mace wants added to the rules package that would specifically say that only biological men can use men's bathrooms and biological women uh, can use uh, women's bathrooms? That remains an open question. And this is, of course, a very divisive issue. Uh, and it is one that Republicans highlighted time and time again on the campaign trail. Some would argue successfully that it was an issue that resonated with many Americans who aren't familiar with transgender rights or nervous about the prospect of transgender people having more rights throughout the country. Uh, so uh, Republicans in many ways trying to capitalize on this issue, which is so personal uh, and really affects the lives of many people in, in a very direct way. Uh, how it plays itself out here on Capitol Hill is something that the speaker doesn't really seem to want to get too involved in, but his uh, fellow Republican members may not give him an option to just avoid it completely, Tom. You know, Ryan, what is your sense? I mean, is this going to be the first big fight sort of of the new Congress? And, the, and I don't know if it, it, if it goes into the administration, but is this, is this what it's going to be about? I mean, I don't know if it's going to be the first big fight, Tom. I don't know if it's going to be something that lingers on throughout the, the congressional term. But I do know it is something that Republican members are talking a lot about. This issue of the role that transgender people play uh, in the United States conversation, the rights that they're asking for, the way that they assert those rights uh, across the country is something that Republicans ran on and fought against in a major way. Uh, so you could definitely see this something that they bring up every opportunity that they have. And it just so happens that this uh, uh, new member of Congress, Sarah McBride, who is the first openly transgender woman uh, to serve in Congress, happens to win the seat at the same time that this has become a political flashpoint yeah. and culture war. So it's not something that Republicans are going to give up on, that's for sure. Whether or not this bathroom issue becomes one that lingers on into the new Congress, that's one we're going to have to wait and see. Ryan Nobles, uh, great to have you. Thank you for explaining all that. For more on the news from Capitol Hill and the Trump transition, I want to bring in our political pros. Julie Roginski, Democratic strategist, Matt Gorman, Republican strategist, and Patrick Svitik, Washington Post reporter. We thank you all for being here. Julie, I want to start with you. This, this transgender bathroom battle, 
What do you think of this? Do you think this is something that Republicans, and we should say Representative Nancy Mace, who, who's bringing this up, do you, do you think her motives here are, are because of what she says, or do you think this is purely politics? I think it's purely politics. And look, one of the advantages of being my age is you were around long enough to remember when the same kind of rhetoric was used against gay people, right? That if you're a gay man, for example, you can't use a men's bathroom because, God forbid, you do something to another man while you're in there. I mean, it's ridiculous. And it, this is exactly the same thing. Sarah McBride is a duly elected member of Congress from Delaware. The people of Delaware sent her there knowing who she is. And if she wants to use the women's bathroom, she's more than welcome to use any bathroom that I'm in, because as a woman, I actually believe that her rights are exactly the same as my own. And for Nancy Mace to exploit this and exploit a really vulnerable community at a time like this for political gain, I think it's just really unconscionable. Look, there's one thing to be made, an argument to be made that a lot of people resonate with, that maybe girls should not play, uh, that, that transgender girls should not play on girls' teams. And, and while I don't necessarily know where I stand on that, I do know that that is an argument that people can make. But when two adults use the bathroom together uh, or the same kind of bathroom together, there's absolutely no... Uh, reason to assume that one is going to do something to the other simply because they are transgender. If Matt, they did, yeah. that would be illegal. Matt, talk to me about this one. We know that one of the closing ads for the, the Trump fans team was that ad of, of Kamala Harris talking about providing prisoners um, with funding to, to have trans surgeries. Um, so my question to you is, do you think this is a, a fight that she's picking because it's going to raise her profile politically? Or do you think she truly does not want to have her fellow representative in the same bathroom with her? I can't speak to her motives. I think yeah. she's emboldened, certainly, by that ad. I mean, the closing line was, Kamala's for they, them, Trump is for us. And look, it spoke to something beyond just that video of Kamala talking about taxpayer-funded gender reassignment surgeries for inmates. It was about culture. It was about priorities, right? And I think the idea here that Republicans feel emboldened, I, I understand why, uh, putting being on this cultural issue. And look, you can do what you did here in D.C. They changed the law, so there's unisex bathrooms. There's unisex bathrooms in the Capitol. I think at the end of the day, they will, they will find some way out of this where everybody feels comfortable and respected to whatever extent. But I'm not going to put, I'm not going to try and cast whatever motives on Nancy uh, she has. Okay, I want to transition now and bring practice. Patrick, uh, into this conversation, I should probably use a better phrase there. But uh, Patrick, regarding the Gates nom nomination, you heard the president digging in his heels earlier, refusing to reconsider Matt Gates for AG. This has now become a game of political chicken with members of his own party. Who do you think will blink first? Yeah, I think the major most recent development in this is that it's becoming increasingly evident that Trump and the transition team are very serious about this nomination, whether it's the statement we heard from Trump tonight or the fact that uh, Vance is coming to Capitol Hill uh, to broker some meetings with Gates uh, later this week. I think when this nomination was first announced, there was some speculation that, you know, maybe Gates, this was some, you know, political chess move. Gates was maybe some sacrificial lamb for another AG nominee down the line. I think what's become very clear uh, also from the outreach that senators say they're receiving is that Trump is very serious about this and is, is willing to spend some real political capital on this particular nomination. I know there was some reporting in the New York Times that, that even President-elect Trump was at, at about 50 percent. He wasn't sure if Gates would get elected. If he thinks he's going to lose this battle, do you think he, he switches gears and, and, and maybe either elevates Todd Blanch or finds somebody else? You know, I don't think that's that's off the table. And I think that, you know, the New York Times reporting um, certainly nods at the fact that Trump understands that Gates, as it stands this moment, may face an uphill battle. But I think the indications right now are right now are that Trump and his transition team are, are willing to fight for the Gates nomination, at least at this moment. Yeah. Matt, wh why do you think Trump is, is going so hard for this one for Matt Gates as AG? I mean, I think, first of all, he likes some respects and certainly is a supporter. But let me step back for a second. I think this is, in, in many ways, negotiation, right? If he can get Matt Gates AG, he will take Matt Gaetz AG. But signaling any weakness, signaling any reconsideration, you know, not even a week since he's been announced and well before any sort of an, uh, confirmation hearing or even a vote, uh, you're just giving license for Democrats, excuse me, Republicans to jump ship off this. You need, uh, if you're the Trump 
transition, maintain total steadfast support behind him, because that's the only way, if this is going to succeed, it does. Julie, what do you think about the confirmation hearings, right? Because an attorney for Matt Gates' accuser tells NBC News that the women do not want to testify in public if the Ethics Committee decides not to release the report. So what, what do you think happens here? And, and how do Democrats sort of handle themselves in those confirmation hearings when you're dealing with something that is so sensitive, like the allegations that are being brought against Matt Gates? I think we already know a lot of what's in this Ethics Committee report. It's already out there. He was alleged, according to the attorney for these women, to, and these women testified that he was having sex with an underage girl. When he found out that she was not yet 18, he allegedly waited until she was 18 and went back to having sex with her at the same time that he was at parties with drugs and underage girls. So, you know, is this somebody that we want as the chief law enforcement officer in the United States? I don't think so. What else do you need to know? And the question that we have to take a look at is how much control is Donald Trump going to have over the Senate? Because I think that's what this really is about. This is about ensuring, from Donald Trump's perspective, that there is no separation of powers, that there is no co-equal branch of government. He already owns the Supreme Court for all intents and purposes. And this is about owning the, the legislative branch as well. And the real question for me is, what is Mitch McConnell going to do, who is no longer the leader? He doesn't have to worry about corralling votes anymore. I don't know that he's running again. This is his last hurrah. Is at the very end of his career, Mitch McConnell finally going to do the right thing and stand up for the institution that he has led over the course of these many years and say, enough is enough. We are not going to allow any president, including this one, to railroad us on our way out the door. And I, and I hope and pray that it's not just the Susan Collins, the Lisa Murkowskis of the world, but it's somebody like a Mitch McConnell who stands up for the, for the sacred duty that I think he has as a United States senator to tell the president that we have advice and consent power here and that we're going to exercise it and not just be a rubber stamp for whoever you want to put up here, no matter how unqualified. Patrick, I'm going to ask our great director, uh, Brett Holy, to roll some video. This is um, just before our broadcast when Elon Musk and President-elect Trump were watching the launch of the SpaceX uh, there in Texas. And, and my question to you is, how is this relationship sort of forming between the president-elect and Elon Musk? I ask because he, he seems to always be by his side. President Trump is there today. But we know that uh, the, the pick for Commerce Secretary was who Elon Musk actually wanted for Treasury Secretary. So clearly Trump is still making his own decisions. How would you describe this relationship right now? Well, look, I mean, taking a, a step back here, I think Trump and Trump has, you know, initially admired uh, Musk for his, you know, business acumen as simply as a, a fellow rich guy. <laughs> We've known that's, uh, you know, a reason that Trump admires other people uh, from the beginning. And then also Musk was just very politically supportive of Trump in this campaign, uh, both with his public activities and his uh, financial activities. Um, and from Musk's perspective, he took a big gamble on backing Trump as much as he did in the final months of this race. And it paid off. And honestly, Musk, just seems in some ways to be reveling in the moment of being so close to political power and someone that he helped uh, elect. And so that, that's how I look at the relationship right now. But as you pointed out, Musk has made some political statements in the past few days um, that have uh, maybe backfired or not or rubbed the Trump transition team the wrong way. He may have gotten out on his skis and pushing for uh, Howard Lutnick for Treasury Secretary. And then, of course, there's been reporting in many outlets that privately some Trump advisors um, are starting to get a little worn out by just how uh, close Musk is staying to Trump and how often he's offering his advice behind the scenes. And so this is a relationship that I think made sense initially. But as it goes on, I think it'll it could show some signs of strain uh, just given the egos involved here. Matt, you get the last word here. Explain to me the Dr. Oz pick with Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, I think a couple things. Before he was a TV doctor, he was just a plain old doctor and a world-renowned thoracic surgeon starting two cardiac care centers, including one up in New York Presbyterian, professor at Columbia. Uh, but more importantly, what this signals is, you're going to see your public administration, I think, take on pharmaceutical companies, even through what J.D. Vance has said when he was on Joe Rogan's show and others in a way that you would not have expected from a Republican administration in the past. Obviously, Dr. Owls will be a part of that. HHS secretary will be a part of that, likely if it's RFK, no matter who it is, you will see pharmaceutical companies most likely on defense. All right. Matt Gorman, Julie Roginski, and Patrick Svint. Always great to see you. Patrick, I remember when you were at the Texas Tribune. Glad to see you at the Post now as well. All right, guys, have a great one. All right, and back here in New York today, the focus back on President-elect Trump's legal battles. The sentencing for the hush money case, which had been set for next week, on hold. Prosecutors saying they're okay with the delay, but arguing against completely throwing out the case. And this proposal still needs sign-off from the judge. 
Laura Jarrett joins us now here on Top Story tonight. So, Laura, how long could this sentencing being put on hold really go? Well, if you're the district attorney's office, you're willing to punt it for four years. Now, I think wait, wait, wait till he's out of office. Wait till 2029 okay. and have this looming over him. His legal team is not going to go for that. They are going to appeal. They'll either run to federal court. They could go to a higher state court. They can't just have it looming over him while he's in office. But I think the judge also has a countervailing consideration, which is if he wipes away the entire case as if it never happened. Happen, then what message does that send to the jury system? Again, we're in a unique circumstance. Yeah. We've never been here before. He's the president-elect. The judge has a tough call. So the next question is then when will the judge rule? Do we know? Uh, we do not know yet, but you would have to imagine this was supposed to go forward on the 26th. That's not going to happen. I think the only question now is how much resolution we see, if we're talking days or weeks now at this point. And again, Judge Mershon here in New York may recognize it's ultimately going to be out of his hands and it could go up on appeal. All right, Laura Jarrett for us. Laura, we appreciate that as always, and we'll stay monitoring this case. Moving overseas now, U.S. officials today say Ukraine fired American-made long-range missiles into Russian territory for the first time after President Biden approved their use. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin says he's lowering the threshold for a nuclear strike. Keir Simmons has more. Tonight, anxious hours after Ukraine fired American-made long-range missiles called ATACMS at a nuclear-armed Russia for the first time, according to two U.S. officials. It comes just days after the White House approved their use outside Ukraine's borders. Tonight, President Putin has lowered the bar for Russia's use of nuclear weapons. Under a new nuclear doctrine, Russia could deploy its arsenal if attacked by a non-nuclear country allied with a nuclear state, a message unmistakably directed at Ukraine and the U.S. I'm Kelly O'Donnell in Rio de Janeiro at the G20 summit, where dozens of international leaders have been gathered, including President Biden and Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, who today called the Ukrainian missile attack an escalation. And he talked about Putin making changes to how Russia could use its nuclear arsenal. We are strongly in favor of doing everything not to allow nuclear war to happen. As for the attackums, Ukraine says they will help resist a Russian offensive supported by North Korean troops just months before President-elect Trump takes office and is expected to demand a deal. Ukraine today marking 1,000 days of war with Russia, with talks on the horizon, but no sign of compromise. Keir Simmons joins us tonight. Keir, so much to talk about, right? First off, how serious is the international community taking Putin's threat of a potential nuclear war? Well, you know, we may not know, uh, Tom. Back in October 2022, we now know that Western leaders were really scared, really worried that Russia was about to launch a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. But we only know that now because some of those leaders have spoken about it in, in the months uh, since, in, in the years uh, since. What we have learned tonight is that the British Prime Minister has described the threats from Russia as Russian rhetoric. So there is certainly an attempt, publicly at least, to portray this as just another nuclear threat among many nuclear threats from President Putin. Yeah, Kier, but I do think it speaks to the escalation here, right? And you touched upon this towards the end of your report. Right. You have President-elect Trump now coming into office in a month or so, two months if you will, and you have him essentially campaigning on the fact that he thinks he can end this war, but things seem to be escalating. So where does that leave him? Yeah. Well, it's all about President-elect Trump. I mean, everything that's happening uh, virtually, the, the tens of thousands of Russian troops uh, along the front line wanting to push Ukrainian troops uh, out of Russia, the decision uh, to allow the Ukrainians to lose these, use these long-range weapons uh, in response to that potential uh, offensive. What you're seeing is an escalation ahead of what we expect, which will be talks, because uh, both sides, effectively on the battlefield, want to assert themselves before those negotiations Tom. Keir Simmons for us. Keir, we thank you for that. Still to come tonight, the desperate search for a woman who went missing after flying to LAX. Her family scouring Los Angeles after she disappeared while traveling from Hawaii to New York. We'll have the latest on that investigation. Plus, the tunnel rescue caught on camera. New videos showing first responders pulling a woman from a 10-foot deep hole. And Italy's $1 homes... The island village offering Americans disgruntled by the election a massive discount on a new spot. 
but the houses up for sale may not be your dream home or villa just yet. We'll explain. Top story just getting started on this Tuesday night. Back now with a search underway for a young woman who suddenly vanished after a misconnection at LAX airport. The family now rushing to LA from across the country to find her. And tonight they're telling NBC News they have reason to believe she's in danger. Ellison Barber has this one. But what we have believed, what we have believed to be telling people is true. This is Hannah Kobayashi's family, her aunts and her dad in Los Angeles, a city where none of them live desperately searching for the 30-year-old who's been missing for more than a week. We honestly don't know what to do. Her family telling NBC News they believe Hannah is in physical danger. There's reason to believe through video surveillance that Hannah is not okay. And everything that we, everything that we have been telling the media, that we've been telling the police has now been confirmed. We cannot speak on it because we do not want to hinder the investigation. But what we have believed, what we have believed to be telling people is true. And we cannot speak more on that. But we, it has been confirmed to us that Hannah is in danger. On November 8th, she took a flight from her hometown in Hawaii, heading to visit her aunt in New York. She left Maui and landed at LAX, but according to her family, missed her connection flight to New York. She only had about 30 to 45 minutes to get from one terminal to the other, and she didn't make it. Surveillance video capturing her as she exited a jetway at LAX. Her family says they were communicating with her. They believe she had a standby ticket and was trying to get on another flight to New York, but decided to spend time exploring LA while she waited. Here's LeBron James event. A video posted to YouTube seemingly catching her for a split second at a Nike event at the city's Grove Mall. But as the days went by, friends and family say they started to get odd texts. It started to get extremely strange and scary. Um, we started getting text message. Basically, the verbiage was unlike her, using words like hun, babe, things that she normally in her own text weren't saying. She said that someone um, might was stealing her identity, that she felt scared, um, that she weird things like um, the matrix. One exchange obtained by our Honolulu affiliate KHNL said, quote, I got tricked pretty much into giving away all my funds for someone I thought I loved. It's been really scary. By Monday, November 11th, her family says all communication stopped. Their panicked calls went straight to voicemail. I'm just, just twisting and turning and spinning. It's just crazy and it is, the, it is every parent's worst nightmare. A spokesperson for the Los Angeles Police Department confirming to NBC News a missing persons report for Hannah Kobayashi was filed on the 15th and detectives are actively investigating. Her family also organizing searches of their own eagerly waiting for any news of their beloved Hannah. We might be small, but we are mighty and we are going to find you. And don't you dare think that we for a second will give up on this. We are, you are in our hearts. The entire world is looking for you. You are that special. And Hannah's family says they believe she is still wearing glasses. They also think she probably has a dark green moss-colored backpack with her. If you see her anywhere around Los Angeles or think you know anything, her family and the LAPD are asking that you contact authorities immediately. If you are wanting to help in terms of canvassing or a search effort, there's information related to that on a Facebook page set up by the family called Help Us Find Hannah. Tom. Okay, Ellison Barber. Ellison, we thank you for that. Coming up, we have some breaking news from the media world. Comcast set to spin off several of its cable networks, including MSNBC. Those details next. Okay, we are back now with Top Stories news feed, starting with the daring tunnel rescue in California. Video shows fire officials pulling a woman out of a 10-foot hole near Los Angeles. Authorities say she accidentally fell in and couldn't pull herself out. She was not hurt. However, police say she was later arrested. No word yet on the reason or possible charges. Okay, that's a strange one. Some breaking news from the media world. Comcast moving forward with the spinoff of its cable networks. A source confirming to the news to CNBC late tonight. The spinoff, which was first reported in the Wall Street Journal, would impact 
CNBC, MSNBC, and E. Separation is expected to take about a year. Comcast is the parent company of NBC News and NBC News Now. And if you're upset over the U.S. election results, an Italian village is offering $1 homes to Americans looking to relocate. A small village in Sardinia selling the one euro homes that will need extensive renovations. They're also offering free temporary homes for people who work remotely or ready to occupy homes for just about $105,000. The village's mayor hopes the effort will revive the community's shrinking population. Okay, coming up next, the debate over what is being taught in Texas elementary schools. Here's why a new proposed curriculum would incorporate lessons from the Bible in classes on reading and writing and history. We'll talk to two people on either side as the issue heads to a final vote on Friday. Stay with us. Our children needs instructional material that contain the Old and the New Testament like the Bible, where it says, train the child in the way of the Lord. Our schools are to educate, not to indoctrinate. This curriculum veers towards indoctrination. We are back now, and you just heard it right there. Residents and religious leaders sounding off at a Texas school board meeting where a controversy is brewing over school curriculum and religion. In a preliminary vote today, the State Board of Education backing a new curriculum that would add more religious content, particularly Christianity, into kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms. The lessons would be optional, but schools would receive financial incentives for adopting the plan. Here are a few of those additions. In kindergarten, a lesson on the Golden Rule incorporates Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, while one for first graders on sharing stories would teach the New Testament's parable of the prodigal son. For older students, a third grade unit on ancient Rome features a section dedicated to the life of Jesus and Christianity in the Roman Empire, and a poetry unit for fifth graders includes psalms from the Old Testament. As many as two million kids in Texas elementary schools could be impacted when the final vote takes place on Friday. For more on all this, I'm joined tonight by Mary Elizabeth Castle, the Director of Government Relations for Texas Values, a nonprofit organization that supports this curriculum, and Dr. Mark Chancy, a professor of religious studies from Southern Methodist University who works closely with Texas Freedom Networks, a grassroots group opposing the curriculum. We thank you both for being here. Dr. Chancy, I'm going to start with you first. Texas Freedom Network recently released a report saying it cannot recommend this curriculum for approval. Why is that, and what's your response to today's vote? Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Yes, Texas Freedom Network released a report by my colleague, fellow religious studies scholar David Brockman, about all of the many problems in these lessons. These lessons very clearly privilege Christianity. They play religious favorites. There are more lessons about Christianity than any other religious tradition, more lessons about Jesus than any other religious figure, more lessons about the Bible than any other sacred text. And the way these lessons tell Bible stories is in a very literalistic fashion that will encourage young children as young as five to accept their religious claims. So uh, I believe, and my colleagues at Texas Freedom Network believe, that public schools can and should teach about religion, but they have to do so in ways that are age-appropriate, religiously sensitive, First Amendment compliant, and academically responsible. Uh, the report by Brockman at the Texas Freedom Network website uh, documents all the examples of religious bias, as well as numerous factual errors. So these are lessons with problems that really are not ready for release. Dr. Chancy, how does it go against the First Amendment? Explain that to our viewers, in your opinion. Sure. So the First Amendment prohibits a government establishment of religion, and courts have held that what that means is that governments should not promote or disparage religion in general or particular religious viewpoints. So when a public school plays religious favorites by emphasizing Christianity more than any other tradition and by teaching about Christianity in a way that's likely to promote encouragement of Christianity's religious claims, then that violates all of our religious freedom. Uh, we think that all children have equal rights at the table. Public schools are for all children, regardless of their religious identity or whether they choose not to be religious at all. Mary Elizabeth, Parents yeah. should determine the religious upbringing of their children. Mary Elizabeth, talk to me about why you support this program, why you want to hear more Bible stories in the classroom, why you think children should be exposed to these Christian, these Christian lessons. 
Well, first of all, it must be acknowledged that the Bible is one of the most widely cited uh, pieces of literature in our Western world. There are over 300 common day idioms that actually come from the Bible. Having these Bible references in these English language arts materials help students become more culturally literate and just literate in general. Uh, we want to make sure that students are prepared for college and that they can understand uh, these influences on the Western world, which include the Bible. Would you be okay if they did the same thing with stories from the Quran, if they learned lessons about Ramadan? W would that be okay? Would that fit into this curriculum? Yeah, no one is saying that we must only have the Bible. Uh, this isn't a test of whether we measure how many times one religion is spoken of and another is spoken of. Uh, the fact is that the Bible has had such a large influence, even a larger influence than other religions on our literature and even the founding of our country. Um, in fact, many who testified yesterday who made that same argument, why don't we use the Quran or other religious texts, they were not able to bring one example of where the Quran or other religious texts actually had influences on common pieces of literature that students read or on the founding of our country, which is discussed in these materials. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the, your, your point, Mary Elizabeth, and, and Doctor, I'm going to get you in here. Are you saying that you can't fully teach the history of this country without seeing it through the prism of the Bible? Well, it's important to note the Bible and Christianity's influence on our founding. In fact, when you think about uh, we are endowed by our creator by with inalienable rights, um, how will students know which creator that uh, the founding fathers were talking about? Uh, there are actually many references in history where the founders talk about their faith. So yes, it is important to understand how Christianity and faith influence the founding fathers. It's a very important piece that I think students should be able to learn about. You know, references to the Bible, obviously there is nothing wrong with that, right? Just like there's references to, to all religions from uh, all, all sort of um, traditions and rituals from other religions as well, whether it be, you know, you're talking about, um, like I said, mentioned Ramadan as well. Um, but I do want to ask you, is that what's happening here? That is not what's happening here. Uh, if uh, that were happening, if we were having broad discussions of a variety of traditions, then this would be a different conversation. But that's not what's happening, and that's not the moment that we're in. What we're seeing is the use of kindergarten through fifth grade language arts and reading lessons to teach children, when they talk about religion, to teach them primarily about Christianity and not other traditions. Are you basically uh, saying, I mean, so just because I feel like we're both, is, yeah, I feel like everyone's talking around the subject here. Do you, do you, are, is your argument essentially you're trying to slip in Christianity into, this, into the, these schools to essentially indoctrinate the children? Yes. Yes, I do not think the presentation of this material is uh, always as academic as its supporters suggest. And I would also note, I'm a biblical scholar, I'm a biblical studies professor, uh, and so I teach about this material, I love teaching about this material. These lessons are not preparing children for college. Children are going to have to unlearn later on much of what they learn in these lessons because it's simply not accurate. Mary Elizabeth, before we go, what would you say to a family that lives in Texas that maybe they, they, don't, they don't believe in Christianity, but they want to send their child to public school um, and, and they don't want this influence? What would you say to them? Absolutely. They, all parents in the state of Texas can take comfort that these materials are just trying to prepare students to better understand literature, arts, and culture in the Western world. You know, 100 years from now, there will be many different other influences uh, as we see so many different points of view be expanded. But as of right now, like you just mentioned, Shakespeare, um, Paradise Lost, um, Dante's Inferno, so many other required readings that students come across um, in college, even in K through 12, reference the Bible. And students should feel at liberty um, to be able to read and understand uh, these biblical references. And they also are protected by the First Amendment to be able to do so. Mary Elizabeth, Dr. Tansy, we thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and being civil. We appreciate this conversation. All right. And we will be right back. Sunny skies and a better crowd than marked last year's opening. There are 168 pavilions for visitors to see, many of them enlarged and refurbished after a long winter's sleep. 
A visitor with the time and money has 646 acres to roam, and such a roam can't be completed in a day. Now that was a news clip from the 1964 World's Fair right here in New York City. Now a World's Fair level celebration is in the works to commemorate 250 years of the great United States. It's called the Great American State Fair. It's going to be held at Iowa's iconic fairgrounds now underway after President-elect Donald Trump floated the idea last year. Our Maggie Vespa traveled to Des Moines to learn more. From its urban east coast to the fertile fields of America's heartland, even the bright lights of Sin City, a colossal patchwork of patriotism is taking shape. With national organizers say all 50 states rapidly prepping plans for ringing in 250 years of independence, marking July 4th, 2026 as the nation's semi-quincentennial. It was billed as the largest and most dramatic fireworks display ever produced in the United States. Celebrations wise, think modern day versions of the 1976 bicentennial or even the renowned roaming expo that was the World's Fair. With one organization touting an update on the famed Freedom Train, another publishing this video on their website promising a flotilla of 80 ships in the port of New York and New Jersey. The maritime gathering in New York Harbor will be the greatest in our history. But it's Iowa's celebration that could take center stage and within a matter of months, though those tasked with carrying it out have no idea how. You're saying no conversations at all. Correct. Like zero, right, right. these are our plans, here's right. what we're thinking, nothing. Yeah. Here's what we do know. Both the state's governor and President-elect Trump have set their sights here on Iowa's iconic state fairgrounds. The same fairgrounds that for decades have marked a must visit for candidates, including on several occasions, Trump himself. Cut to last year when the then candidate released a video laying out his version for the lead up to America's 250th birthday bash. My hope is that the amazing people of Iowa will work with my administration to open up the legendary Iowa State Fairgrounds to host the Great American State Fair, a unique one year exhibition featuring pavilions from all 50 states. It'll be something. Earlier this month, after Trump's win, Iowa's governor reposted that clip, saying Iowans dream big and stand ready to host the Great American State Fair, giving her state the green light and State Fair CEO Jeremy Parsons a tight deadline. We're talking about a year-long exhibition, <laughs> so starting like this coming summer, are any plans in place? Right. N no. Um, <laughs> again, no, no official conversation. So would you like plans to be in place by now? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, takes a, it takes a long time to plan an event. Is Trump's Iowa idea then in addition to what you were all planning? Absolutely. Rosie Rios chairs America 250, a congressional commission established in 2016 by the Obama administration to plan national celebrations for the semi-quincentennial. Students can earn a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to explore America. The commission already launching an essay competition taking students to iconic landmarks and now working overtime to weave the president-elect's vision into their broader plans. People really want something to plan for, something that unifies all of us. And so far, we've been heading in that direction. We look forward to working with the Trump administration on all these ideas. Rios adds organizers are motivated by a bigger picture, with America's anniversary coming alongside a list of blockbuster events set to aim a global spotlight at the U.S., including the 2026 World Cup set to be played in cities across North America and the 2028 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. It's an opportunity to use that global platform to our advantage to kind of uh, make everyone realize that we are the oldest democracy in the world and how we can actually, you know, hopefully be that unifying force moving forward, I think is a great opportunity for all of us. Back in Iowa, cattle rancher Jordan Vandermolen would be thrilled to see that opportunity rooted in his home state. Hopefully people see the rural America and farm side of things, the aspect. It's not just, you know, concrete buildings and city living. The people are just very humble people in the Midwest. The third generation farmer adding as an avid Trump supporter, he's not worried about logistics. He could pull off miracles and it wouldn't surprise you one bit. You think he could do it? Absolutely, 110%. Maggie Vespa joins us tonight from Des Moines, Iowa. Maggie, miracle or not, these are ambitious plans, so who's paying for all of this? 
Well, it's kind of a mixed bag state to state. That national organization that we talked about, America 250, they've received close to $50 million in federal funds since they were founded in 2016. And some of that money will go toward helping states pay for their celebrations. But when we're talking about this big year-long Iowa extravaganza, frankly, it's unclear who would pay for it or how much it would cost. And for reference, putting on the standard Iowa State Fair last year cost $45 million, and that thing lasts for 11 days. We're talking about a year here if this comes to fruition. And Tom, for what it's worth, we reached out to the president-elect's team for any more details on how this might happen. We haven't yet heard back, but obviously the clock is ticking. And then I'm going to give you a pop quiz here. You said it in the report, but say it one more time. What is it called when, when our country celebrates 250 years? The semi-quincentennial, I had to practice it a lot. Thank semi -quintin you. Semi-quincentennial. I don't think <laughs> I said it right. Maggie Vespa, I'm glad you said it. Uh, great story. <laughs> and we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.